I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Because I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. Good afternoon, everybody. 57 years on, and the events of the last few weeks suggest that Martin Luther King's dream still seems a long way off. We're taking a break from spiritual lessons in lockdown to think about the issue that's knocked the pandemic off the front pages this week. In fact, we're going back to the lesson of a few weeks ago. We are all valuable. We've got two great interview slots for you. Later on, we're going to hear from Australian musician Scott Darlow from Melbourne about how we can respond to racial injustice. First up, though, we've got three of our pupils, Jobber, alongside equality pupil leaders George and Ines, sharing their response to the news and their reflections on fighting for racial equality here at Canford. Hey, uh, my name's George. I'm in lower sixth right now. And um, I'm in Lancaster. And right now I am at Canford. Um, just, but obviously different Canford, so because yeah. there's no one here. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Ines. I'm in lower sixth. Well, current lower sixth. Next year I'll be upper sixth. Um, I'm Equality People Leader and I'm currently in London. Hi, I'm Jobba. I'm in Lower Sec, current Lower Sec, going to Upper Sec. Um, I'm in Franklin. Um, I'm in London right now. And at first I was obviously shocked and horrified, but I had seen this before. You know, this is something that has happened in in lots of occasions and uh you know this is a problem of systematic racism so basically it it happens more than once but this story did did blow up and i'm very glad that it did like inez it was i was very sad but also it's happened so many times before but as i've seen the response online and in protest and everything, I am hopeful that a change is going to come, which needs to come as well. So, and then it was only like after maybe a couple of days until I saw the actual video. That was what was really bad, in my opinion, because obviously you do see, like, or you do hear of it happen a lot of in, in America. But that video, I think, hit a lot of people differently, especially because of how cooperative he was also helped me to kind of see like seeing the support from people of colour and people of non-colour kind of just like made me really happy to see that like and it's really nice to see everyone come together to unite and express their views. Um, I would say not towards me but at school last year, there was a lot of um, people who I was around who thought it was okay to just freely use the N-word just in everyday conversation. And although it wasn't directed towards someone, it was, they, d they just thought it was acceptable to say. And sometimes I've rea I have, in that instance, I did, call them out on it which actually um they sort of then gave me more hassle for it but there's times when at school I haven't called it out and that and I regret that now because I realize it you, you that is the one of the most important things and something I should have done and in the future I will be doing um more. yeah I think I agree, like there are a lot of people, or not a lot, but there are more than one anyway, people that use like racial slurs, like N-word for example. And even they even use it around me. 
and afterwards you go, oh, I'm sorry, or stuff like that. And for me, it's not like the fact, because when people say it, personally, I don't really care because I know their intentions aren't bad. But like the fact that they could accidentally say it could one imply that they say it too much anyway, which I think is really bad. And I don't think there is any racism at Canford because no one like actually intends it, which is good. But there are people that do say racial slurs and like you say, claim pull um sort of claim it to be a joke. And I don't think, like, you can joke about that kind of stuff. Um, I think, obviously, I'm so lucky to be who I am. Um, but being white, being up middle to upper class, obviously I have seen and experienced a lot of white privilege. And although I'm grateful for it, I understand my position and I'm able to use my position to help create awareness about this and you know George and Jova's um, experiences obviously I've seen those as well and the issue with saying slurs like this is is the connotations that they have it's where they come from the n-word that's what slave owners used to call the people that worked for them their slaves and it's really sad to hear people still using that word that has damaged so many lives and so many generations. I think, um, for me, I think having the conversations with people and if, if someone um, see, hears someone or sees someone doing something, which obviously they may not, as a joke, I think it's important to call them out on that um, and I think it's also important to teach people and show people what is right and wrong and what's acceptable in society and um, I think that we need to you know get to the root of the problem which is people's understanding of, of racism our first step which you know i think is what me and george are doing as equality people leaders is to get the ball rolling we're not trying to finish this battle we're just trying to start it um, from experience um when i was in like lower schools like shells of force people would like come up to me from all the year groups and like make racist jokes like believing it's funny and obviously because me personally i didn't care because that's just the person i am but for other people, like it could affect them. So I think just building relationships between younger and older pupils could help because then you will feel more inclined to be polite to them, to be nice to them, and hopefully like stray away from using negative or racial slurs. Um, there's one, there's a quote from Angela Davis who says, it's in a racist society, it is not enough to be non-racist, we must be anti-racist. And I think that is an important message to take. Um, I just want to like remind everyone to sign petitions. You know, um, it's really important to get those petitions signed. If you can donate, make sure you're donating to the right um, places, donate to bail funds. And if you're unable to donate, there are incredible creators such as this girl called Zoe Amira. Um, if you go on YouTube and just search up Watch to Donate, um, every single ad that appears in that video and the money made from the ad revenue goes straight into bail funds. So. Um, yeah, I would like to say I've been like seeing a lot of people um, post like blackout, like Tuesday or something it was. I think, and that compared to um, the amount of people that had actually donated to like a charity or for the greater cause is quite low. So personally, I'd prefer people to actually change, like show that you care about racism, not just, you know, put it up for Instagram clout or for Snapchat. Like I'd rather people, um, you know, call people out when they use racial slurs or actively do something against racism in their 
household or around their friends than to just you know on instagram just because other people are doing it or because you know people will like the post. Uh, thank you so much um guys for being with us this afternoon thank you for your contributions they've been excellent thank you for your honesty about uh, your experiences and also thank you for thinking about how we can um, get better as a community in being you know truly diverse and inclusive and so thanks guys very much indeed thank you thanks, uh, and great to welcome scott darlow uh, our old friend from melbourne australia back to camford if not physically uh, over zoom scott great to see you how are you doing i'm doing tremendously mr jack how are you doing yeah very well um scott you've been over to camford as i said several times before uh one of the things you've talked about at camford one of the things i know you're you're deeply passionate about is is racial equality uh, give us a bit of background for why it's such a big issue for you personally. Uh, well, it, it's a huge issue for me personally, A, because I, uh, I'm a human being and, and just empathy is big for me and it always has been. And, uh, but on a, on a more personal <laughs> note, uh, my, my mum's family, my half of my family is Indigenous Australian, Native Australian. Um, and so for us, we have a lot of the similar outcomes and statistics that African Americans are facing in the United States, and I might want to point out also that it's not just African Americans who are going through all of this stuff in, in in the states at the moment. It's also Native Americans who are. There's some horrendous stuff going on with those guys as well. Yeah, it's it's something that I'm deeply passionate about because of my family and it's people that I care about. Um, you know, and if I'm really honest, as a follower of Jesus, that's what we're commanded to do: is to love our neighbour as ourselves. Uh, and when I see my neighbours being not loved, that makes me angry as well and upset. Why do you think racism actually is a problem all over the world, uh, across lots of different cultural divides and all through history? You know, where does it come mm. from? What do you think kind of is the driving force behind it? Uh, sinful, evil hearts, arrogance and greed. A lot of it comes from greed. I've spent a lot of time in America and I never really understood America until I went to Virginia where I went to the National War Museum. And it's a big history on the Civil War. And it all boils down to slavery. And it all boils down to greed. One group of people using another group of people to get rich. And when we look at the history of the planet in regards to colonization, it's the same thing. It's unfortunately the English Empire, the British Empire, going out and saying, we're gonna, we're gonna steal this people's land because we want more. We're gonna take that and we're gonna put you to work. We're going to bring these slaves from Africa and we're going to put them to work. Uh, it boils down to greed and sin and a sinful heart. Um, and, you know, the Bible, not to, not to get all Ned Flanders on you guys, you know, he's a, a, a very religious character in The Simpsons for those who don't watch it, but the Bible talks about the sins of the father will be revisited on the son and the son and the son. Like, there's generational consequence for sin. Uh, and that's what we're seeing. You know, we are seeing... America implode because they are a nation that has been built on the back of slavery and hatred and and moral discrepancy. You know, in Australia, we are seeing a blow up because First Nations people in this country have been treated as subhuman. And in fact, until 1967 on our referendum, Aboriginal Australians were legally classified as flora and fauna. That's our history. And unfortunately, we are now paying paying the price for it worldwide. I'm, I'm trying to work out, you know, someone might not just turn around and say something that is kind of flat out racist. Um, but there may be things that we do or say or attitudes we have or, or the way we behave in some way that actually mm. reveals a, a kind of racial prejudice that we didn't even know we had. Can, can you think yep. of things like that? Oh yeah, all the time. I think we've all got those. We've all got those little things about us that are probably not great. Me included. You know, every time, every time I find somebody who who supports Liverpool, that just makes me judge them very badly. Um, but you know, we do. We we carry our biases, um, and without knowing each person's heart and story, I think the best way around it is to try to. And I don't say this to push my own barrow, but I think the best way to do it to, to try and get around it is to wear a flute lens every day. You know, because what you can do when you do that is you actually are constantly checking yourself. That's a constant assessment of who you are and your attitudes. Tell us yeah. very briefly, give us a kind of short version of flute and how it works in your life. Yeah, flute is an acronym 
and it stands for forgiveness, love, understanding, tolerance, and empathy. And and I truly believe that if we are getting around each day wearing a flute lens, what I call a flute lens. So every time you encounter another human being, you are neg negotiating that encounter with a flute lens, right? And so you're doing your very best to show more forgiveness to every person that wrongs you, more love. So actions of random kindness, you know, and you might see somebody that you go, you know, I'm not, a bit, not sure about that guy. No, stop. Show some love to that guy. You know, understanding. There's a reason for everything you see on this planet. But when we lose the ability to actually really look for the reasons why things happen, that's when we get into real strife. And that's when judgment comes into play. So understanding is crucial when we, we, we've got to stop and really spend time. And that's why I was talking about earlier about educating yourself. You've got to really be educated because that is a depth of understanding that we lack right now in this world. Forgiveness, love, understanding. T is for tolerance. Now, tolerance is the ability to put up with people that upset or annoy you. When, you know, and, and, and when you tolerate, what you're really doing is you're choosing to forgive them immediately. You don't let things build up to that level where you carry your grudges and it infects the way that you do relationships, you know. And E is for empathy. Probably the most important word here is empathy, you know. And a lot of people talk about empathy, but I don't know that they actually really do it. That ability to, 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 to feel, it, it's, it goes beyond thinking. It's actually, it's empathy's here. It is, how would I feel if that was my family? How would I feel if I was that black kid who had been pulled over for no reason? You know, how would I feel if that was my journey? And I, I just think if we were all in a position to every day wear that flute lens and check ourselves with it, you know, those little prejudices and biases that you're talking about, they would dissipate rapidly. Yeah, that's amazing. That's really helpful. Okay, last question, if that's okay. You, you, it's come out already a little bit, um, but just, just, just expand a tiny bit more on how your own faith has impacted maybe how you got to this idea of flute or your understanding of racism and how you respond to it. Uh, yeah, well, so, look, there's a lot of Christians in the world, uh, and there's less of those that are actually followers of Jesus. There's two very different things, being a Christian and being a follower of Jesus. Uh, and, you know, it's funny, when you read the scriptures, there was a lot of Christians back then as well. They were called Pharisees, you know, and it's really Jesus is really clear in the scripture. He says, you know, there's a high cost for following him. Um, but the benefit is, is, is that you turn into the sort of human being that everybody wants to be around. You look at who Jesus was as a dude. He was the best. He was the bomb. He was the best guy going around, you know, and that's the sort of guy that I want to be like, you know, we talk about heroes, all these kids getting around going, I want to be like Michael Jordan. I just watched that documentary. He didn't seem like a very nice guy. I don't want to be like Michael Jordan. You know, I, I want to be like somebody who inspires me. And so I look at who Jesus is and was, and he's a legend. He's, a, he's the coolest dude ever. So I want to be like that guy. Um, and, you know, flute is just a practical way of, of doing the things that Jesus told us to do. You know, I, I'm like any little kid who grows up with these heroes that he wants to be like, well, it's just that I never kind of grew up. I just got longer hair. Um, unlike you, Phil. Uh, <laughs> you know, so yeah, flute is a practical way that we can just try to be like this guy who's the greatest dude ever. Thank you so much to Scott and to our pupils for their contributions to this week's Chapel podcast. As we finish, I have got one final reflection for us. Scott spoke about how Jesus was an incredible and is an incredible role model for living the flute life. In, in Scott's words, he's the bomb. But he's also way more than that. He's way more than an example. One of the miracles coming out of the messy history of race relations in America is the black church. Tragically, many white Christians in America were and still are racist. There's no excuse for that. It's plainly against everything that Jesus and his teachings stand for. However, the Jesus of Scripture, the one who cared for the oppressed, who cared for the marginalised, who, who embraced the slave's role to the point of death even on a cross, made a profound impression, first on the black slaves in the 19th century, and later on Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, and still does today. For a Christian, Forgiveness, love, understanding, tolerance and empathy, flute, flow first from receiving those things from Christ himself. Josiah Henson was the man who inspired Harriet Beecher Stowe's character Uncle Tom in Uncle Tom's Cabin. Born a slave, Henson heard the Christian gospel when he was 18 and he was blown away. 
He said this, I cried out, I wonder if Jesus Christ died for me. See, he was overwhelmed by the idea that, quote, a poor, despised and abused creature, deemed by others fit for nothing but mental and bodily degradation, was known and loved by Jesus himself. He said, oh, the blessedness and sweetness of feeling that I was loved. Henson escaped from slavery and went on to set up a refuge for escaped slaves in Canada and became a Christian preacher. Now, in the message that he proclaimed, we find both healing for where we've been victims of injustice and also forgiveness for where we've been perpetrators. It's truly amazing grace. And we're going to finish this week's podcast with Stormzy's take on this topic. His big hit, Blinded by Your Grace. Before that, I'm going to say a short prayer. Heavenly Father, please would you forgive us when we have not valued others as being made in your image and those for whom Christ died. Please would you help us to fight against racial injustice and truly accept one another, living with a flute perspective. We ask too that there will be a profound and lasting change in our society and in communities all over the world. Please would Martin Luther King's dream become a reality. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yo. Radio One Live Lounge. Gang signs and prayer. Yo. I'm blinded by your grace. I'm blinded by your grace, by your grace. I'm blinded by your grace. I'm blinded by your Lord. I've been broken. Though I'm not worthy, you fix me. I'm blinded by your grace. You came and saved me. Lord, I've been broken. One time for the Lord, and one time for the cause. And one round of applause, one time for Fraser T. Smith for the cause. I thought we got one, I stay prayed up, then I get the job done. Yeah, I'm Abigail's youth, but I'm God's son. But I'm up now, look at what God's done. Now I'm real tall, look at what God did. On the main stage, running round topless. I phone flips, then I tell him that we got this. This is God's plan, they can never stop this. Like, wait right there, could you stop my verse? You save this kid and I'm not your first. It's not by blood, it's not by birth. But oh my God, what a God I serve. Whoa.
Lord is my King, my Savior.